you ready? And um, yeah, welcome. What Anthony and I are going to try and do this afternoon, I'm going to speak for 20 minutes each, and as Josie said, and then we're going to invite questions. We're going to really try to cover quite a lot of ground from design to application, including engineering of biocatalysts. You probably appreciate this is a, a very diverse field, so um, I'm going to give some sort of introduction because I'm we're sort of working on the basis that perhaps not all of you by any means are experts in biocatalysis. So some of my early slides will be very much um, sort of high level, you know, why, why biocatalysis? What, what are the sort of key issues in biocatalysis as you'll see? So this first slide really tries to capture pretty much everything that's going on in biocatalysis. This field is, is really changed out of all recognition in the last 10 years and, and continues to change because there are so many new technologies that are being applied to biocatalysis. So if you look at the left hand side, you will see the different ways that people go about finding and uh, designing new enzymes. Anthony is going to talk very much about computational design. This is probably the most exciting, and the newest sort of aspect of biocatalysis, computational design. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the use of metagenomics, I mean, this is a tool that we use increasingly. Um, in the middle is, is what the whole field is all about, and that is generating new catalysts for applications in synthesis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about target molecule synthesis. People have always been interested in mobilizing enzymes, but increasingly they're starting to use enzymes in flow. So again, that's another new development. And really, I think one of the sort of key factors that's probably promoted and had the biggest impact is the fact that we can now almost at will improve enzymes, uh, evolve enzymes, engineer them to have improved activity, selectivity, etc. And that's really the, the, the application of directed evolution technologies. And you'll see that feature uh, in both of our talks. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about synthesis. Synthesis is intimately coupled to retrosynthesis. And so a few years ago, we felt it was timely to, to bring in this sort of language of retrosynthesis that is widely used in organic synthesis. Those of you who have been trained as organic chemists will have been trained in probably your second year to dissect and disconnect target molecules back to starting materials that can be more easily prepared and you know certainly 10 years ago people didn't use this language in biocatalysis so we started to promote this uh, we wrote a book recently with my colleague uh, Luke Humphreys and I tried to capture both the sort of forward and reverse aspects of biocatalysis in this book and uh, the very latest is we now have a computational tool which we just put online uh, where you can actually put in molecules, target molecules, and do computer-assisted synthesis planning to, to do retro biocatalytic uh, design. And we expect that to sort of help in this whole endeavor. And, and cascades fit nicely into this notion. People are increasingly not just using single enzymes to do synthetic transformations, but putting together multiple enzymes and if you think about it that that maybe is a good idea because that's the way nature makes molecules via cascades not just single processes and that brings together again a lot of the sort of contemporary thinking the idea of retrosynthesis finding enzymes engineering them putting them together in cascades optimizing cascades and and it really i think is is the future in terms of how people are going to increasingly apply this this type of science so I'm going to talk a little bit about target molecule synthesis. We've had a strong interest for a number of years in, in amines. As you'll see, amines are a very good test bed for emerging biocatalytic technology. These, this slide shows some chiral amines initially at the top of the slide. So chiral amines feature very prominently in pharmaceuticals. These are active pharmaceutical ingredients. Something like 45% of all APIs contain a chiral amine. 
Okay, so they're a really major sort of subset of, of drugs in development or in the clinic. As you get work down the slide, obviously amines come in very simple forms sometimes. These are monomers for polymers. Um, so one day maybe these molecules will be made using biocatalysis. And amines feature strongly in heterocycles, both uh, aromatic and non-aromatic. Again, here's some pharmaceutical type molecules. And so you can see nitrogen containing compounds are very, very important. So what we wondered a number of years ago was the degree to which you might be able to assemble these molecules using biocatalysis. And this is the state of the art. So this slide shows essentially what I call the biocatalytic amine toolbox. These are the seven principal synthetic methodologies that are available for making chiral amines using biocatalysis. Some of them are now very familiar. So if I can just perhaps highlight transaminases, these are widely used in industry for making APIs, for making agrochemicals. And they're very attractive enzymes because they convert ketones directly to amines. So you set the stereogenic center as well as creating the functional group in one step. And I'm going to talk about some of the other approaches. Uh, the other thing to highlight on this slide is that um, the, the numbers in red indicate the number of different enzymes we have in these respective categories. So this is our sort of toolbox. We have a, we have a very strong collaboration with a company called Prozomex, who are based in the north of England. Our entire enzyme collection is available from Prozomix. So if you want to get any of the enzymes that I talk about or you've seen us publish, then um, you can get them directly from Prozomix in panels. So I'm just going to talk briefly about amine oxidases. This was the very first enzyme we decided to engineer quite a number of years ago, but it, it serves as a sort of useful paradigm for what is possible in terms of protein engineering. This enzyme oxidizes amines to imines using oxygen. So it's a very mild way of oxidizing an amine. We now have lots of variants of this enzyme, as you'll see. And it turned out to be a highly evolvable enzyme. So it's, it's, it's led on to lots of very useful variants. Uh, and so these are all the target molecules which we've subsequently been able to make using engineered versions of this enzyme. Um, and suffice to say that none of these molecules can be made using the wild type version of this enzyme. So it's only through the process of protein engineering and directed evolution that we've been able to create variants of this monoamine oxidase that can now make relatively sort of structurally more complex building blocks for the pharmaceuticals. One of the ways we apply this enzyme is in this so-called deracinization process where we take racemic amines with the engineered enzyme in the presence of oxygen. We oxidize one enantiomer to the imine, which leaves the other enantiomer untouched. And then we recycle the imine back to the uh, racemic amine and that process converts racemic amine to an antimerically pure product. And so this is how we engineered it. We devised a high throughput screening method a number of years ago based on a colony screen that generates color if the enzyme variant is active towards the substrate. So we can generate libraries of hundreds of thousands of variants per cycle of evolution. And um, we then use that to pick out improved variants at each cycle of the evolutionary process. And we took the best mutant from uh, the first step and use that to seed the library for the second step, etc. And via this process, we created a set of variants with broad activity towards these uh, different target molecules. And the sort of improvements in terms of the, the numbers, the sort of improvements you get are significant. So in our case, we were able to find enzymes that have three orders of magnitude greater activity compared to the wild type enzyme. And this is what I call the family tree of these enzymes. So we started off with an enzyme that had good activity, but only towards very, very simple substrates. That's the wild type enzyme. And by this process of directed evolution, 
introducing sequential mutations and screening towards different substrates, we were able to uh, end up with, in this case, a mutant that's got 11 mutations compared to the wild type and is able to tolerate much more structurally diverse substrates. And then the second set of enzymes I just want to talk briefly about is a much more recent story. So these are enzymes that are able to catalyze imine reduction. That's indicated here of cyclic imines to give chiral secondary amines. And again, we have large numbers of these, as you'll see. And that led us on to what are even more powerful enzymes that can catalyze reductive amination of ketones with amines to give chiral amines. Now, the way we've created this latest set of enzymes is via this approach of metagenomics. So basically, we, we use sequenced metagenomes to find new homologs of existing enzymes. Uh, and then we build the DNA, we convert that into the enzyme, and we construct plates, each of which contain 384 different imine reductases or reductive amylases. We do this with our company, Partner Prosomics, so we can not only we, we go all the way from design of the enzymes using the metagenomic sequences through to production, essentially mass production of these plates, which can then be used by anybody around the world for screening uh, towards substrates of interest. So this work was carried out by James Marshall, who's a PhD student in my group. Uh, we also devised a colorimetric screen, which actually works in the reverse direction. But if you know the target amine you want to make, you can screen the entire plate in a few hours colorimetrically to see if there are any likely candidates that you might want to use in the synthesis direction. And this whole technology is really, I think, sort of becoming very dominant and, 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 and it's going to have a big impact on biocatalysis because you can do this for any enzyme family. I mean, it's clearly not limited to immune reductases. As long as you have sequence data, which you always do have, if you have you know, the gene for the enzyme that you're interested in, you can use that to go looking for homologs in, in metagenomic libraries. And you can build these plates, you can manufacture them, and then you can screen them in the lab very, very quickly. Um, and that's what James is doing here. And so within a few hours, or certainly less than 24 hours, you can get an idea of which of those catalysts those individually different biocatalysts you may want to focus on for further rounds of protein engineering. These are all wild type enzymes at this stage, but each of them is a candidate for further protein engineering, clearly. And so we have applied imine reductases widely. Um, we've shown that they can be used to catalyze asymmetric reduction of a wide range of different imines of different ring sizes, five, six, seven, some more sterically demanding than others. Uh, they can reduce aminium ions, they can be combined with other enzymes to deracinize, and we've shown that they can be applied already in natural products and target molecule synthesis, despite the fact that they're relatively new uh, enzymes. So here's a recent paper with my colleague, Jonathan Clayton from Bristol. And here the target was to make uh, these two substituted azepanes in an antimerically pure form for further chemistry that Jonathan has pioneered, where you then introduce a second aryl group by lithiation chemistry. But in terms of reductases, we screened our panel and rapidly found enzymes that could generate either an antimer of the desired intermediate um, in essentially an antimerically pure form. Enzymes, perhaps I didn't say this at the beginning, often give you an antimerically pure products. I mean, that's not an unusual feature of enzyme catalysis. And then uh, in 2017, Godwin Leku and others, Scott France in the group, uh, found homologues of imine reductases that were able to catalyze reductive amination. So this was a very exciting breakthrough. This expanded the whole chemistry beyond just imine reduction towards reductive amination, which is a very powerful way of assembling molecules from uh, 
ketone and amine precursors. They look like irids, but they have this additional sort of catalytic activity. And the group showed that they could couple amines and ketones essentially in one-to-one -one stoichiometry in water, which is a pretty remarkable feat. They have good activity, high turnover numbers, they're tolerant to high substrate concentrations, and so they are really um, very exciting new enzymes that have, have sort of been added to the toolbox. And to give you a sense of how quickly industry picks up on this technology now, we have a collaboration with Pfizer. We published the first sequences in 2017. Two years later, Pfizer had taken um, some of these sequences and developed uh, scaled up processes for manufacturing late stage API intermediates. And this is a Pfizer compound where they do a reductive emanation on the cyclohexanone derivative. It's a diastereoselective selective reductive emanation, and they've already made a metric ton of product using an engineered um, reductive aminase. So this is, this is a, a real feature of biocatalysis now. Uh, inventions, discoveries in academic labs become translated into industrial application very, very quickly. And the final slide is another way we've used this in a recent collaboration. Uh, sorry, a recent uh, paper from our group. This is the work principally of Jeremy Ramsden and Rachel Heath, where they've started off with uh, carboxylic acids and alcohols and used those as, as sustainable feedstocks for aiming synthesis by initial either reduction or oxidation respectively to the aldehyde, so the acid to the aldehyde or the alcohol to the aldehyde, using other engineered enzymes I haven't got time to talk about today, carboxylic acid reductases, alcohol oxidases, and then the aldehyde becomes the key intermediate for reductive emanation via this approach. So we can produce amines from sustainable feedstocks by this uh, methodology. And that's my uh, part, uh, just to thank the group enormously for their fantastic efforts, the intellectual and experimental. And you can see from the slide that we enjoy a lot of collaborations with industry. That's always been a sort of feature of the work we do. We do fundamental science, but we work closely with a lot of people in different parts of the chemical industry, particularly pharmaceutical, to try and get this science and technology into applications as soon as possible. So that is my part. And I'm hoping, Anthony, you will be able to take over now. Yeah, so I've just started showing my screen neck. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, so first of all, thanks to Nick for the great introduction to the field. Um, and also good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for, thanks for listening in. Okay, so what I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so, maybe 20, 25 minutes talking about is the efforts ongoing in our lab to design and engineer enzymes in situations where nature has not given, given us enzymes, uh, sorry, as, where the catalytic function of interest is not represented in nature. So just as by way of an introduction at the top of this slide, um, this is really just covering uh, some of the work that Nick's already spoken about. And so this is an incredibly powerful approach uh, that really the field of biocatalysis is based upon, where we're able to sample natural enzymes. So this is all, we identify an enzyme from nature um, with an activity of interest, and we can subject this enzyme to protein engineering, or sometimes called direct evolution, effectively involved in optimizing the protein sequence just to adapt the function of the enzyme to perform new tasks. But for many desirable chemical transformations, there are simply no natural enzymes that are, no, that are available um, to, that can serve as starting points for this protein engineering. So this realization has really inspired, sorry, my clicking is not working, but it'll pick, hopefully click in soon. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so, this has really inspired uh, like a handful of research around the world to take, try and take a complementary approach. And so can we begin to design and build enzymes from effectively from scratch? And probably the most promising strategy today, probably pioneered uh, largely by David Baker's laboratory, Don Hill, that was certainly a big player in this field as well, is computational enzyme design. 
So I'm not going to go into all the details of the design process, but what I'm going to talk, just I'll just give a brief schematic overview. And um, what we start off with here is a quantum mechanically calculated rate limiting transitivity. These R1, uh, R2 and R3 groups are effectively amino acid side chains, which are used as functional groups to stabilize the transitivity. And really the aim of the game here is to try and generate a protein sequence. So using powerful algorithms such as Rosetta Match, Rosetta Design, pioneered by Baker's lab, and um, the idea is to develop a protein which, best, which effectively binds effectively to this transition state and therefore stabilizes this rate limiting transition state. And so to date, this computational design approach has been able to deliver what I would say a primitive catalyst uh, for a handful of chemical transformations. And um, so the, the, the efficiency of these catalysts is typically orders of magnitude lower than uh, natural enzymes. But because we genetically encode these species, we can exploit directed evolution and protein engineering to improve the efficiency. And the, this combination of enzyme design and laboratory evolution has begun to deliver enzymes with efficiencies approaching natural enzymes. And so um, I'm just going to highlight here, like just on one slide, an overview of the field. Okay, so today um, I would say there's a rather narrow and limited range of reactions that have been tackled. So really, you're looking at three reactions, the chem polymerase and the diels aldolase, the single, single transition state processes. Uh, you also have these retroaldolases. But I think one of the challenges faced in the design field is that if, if you look at all of these reactions have previously been tackled with the sort of the other great protein catalyst design approach, um, which is catalytic antibodies. And I think for design really to progress now to practical applications, what we've got to begin to show is that we can start to deliver enzymes for sort of more energetic, energetically demanding and complex chemical transformations for which no protein catalysts have known and have not been developed previously. And so when I started my group a few years ago, one of the reactions that we were very keen to target was this Marita Baylor Southern reaction. So this is an iconic uh, reaction in organic synthesis. It's a notoriously slow and challenging reaction to catalyze. And so just to briefly explain how this works, what we're gonna do is we're gonna couple um, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds um, with aldehydes. So the alpha beta carbon is shown in red, the aldehyde is shown in blue. And the way this typically works in organic synthesis is we use a, a, a small molecule catalytic nucleophile. This does a micro addition, generates this first um, enolate type intermediate. Um, then we get an aldol type reaction. Um, this gives us a second anionic species. We then get a proton transfer from the C alpha to the alkoxide. This generates a third intermediate, which is again anionic, but is not shown on this slide. And um, this then eliminates the nucleophile, and then that can just go back through the catalytic cycle. So I should say that at the outset of this study, there were no known protein catalysts for this reaction. So this is the most sophisticated design attempted um, to date. And so I just want to highlight a few key features of the design model. Okay, so. The first thing, as I've already indicated, we're going to need a catalytic nucleophile, and we elected to use histones. We've got hydrogen bonding, a hydrogen bond donor, um, which is intended to stabilize intermediate one, as shown at the top of the slide. We then have a second hydrogen bond donor built into the catalyst, which is intended to stabilize intermediate two. Um, and so if we, we sort of use this for the, for the input for the protein design algorithms, and having sampled approximately 100 designs, so this is work from David Baker's lab in terms of the computational design elements of it. What we found is an active catalyst which exploits um, this histidine 23 catalytic nucleophile. We have the glutamine 128, which is intended to be the first oxyanion hole. We've got an ordered water molecule bound through serine 22, which is intended to be the second hydrogen bonding donor. And if you look at the catalytic activity, like almost all designs, what we find is that we've got modest, like modestly active catalysts. But considering the complexity of this transformation, it's actually, I think, quite an impressive feat that they've managed to get this through the design process. And so an important, always an important thing when you're, when you're looking at the activity is um, the comparison to what I would call to an, an effectively a knockout. So what we've got here in, um, in sort of an orange color is the HPLC trace of product formation with the design catalyst. And if you remove the catalytic histidine, which is the essential residue, what you can see is that you've got a, like a substantial reduction in activity. So again, this is still at this stage a very primitive catalyst, but this is where sort of our lab come in and we can start now to exploit direct evolution to really ramp up and, and optimize the efficiency of this. Now, during the evolution, probably the most important thing is that you have to develop a robust and, and a high throughput assay to allow you to sample as many protein variants as possible. 
And at the outset of this project, there simply was no high throughput spectrophotometric assay that could report on this marine scale tail analysis. So at the outset of the project, um, what, we've, what we've done here is now design such an assay. And so the way we've done this is we've taken the bailiff on the product and we've converted the alcohol into an acid toxic group to make it into a good leaving group. And so the mechanistic hypothesis here is that upon addition of the histamine 23 nucleophile, you generate an enolate intermediate. And this is reminiscent of the third intermediate in the catalytic cycle. And then what in, was intended to happen is that you get an elimination of this acid toxic group. This would then generate an extended pi system, and as shown with the red cursor here, and we felt we could be able to begin to monitor that spectrophotometrically. And so, as you can see here experimentally, if we incubate the enzyme with this mechanistic inhibitor, we get a, a effectively an irreversible addition, um, generating the colored species. And you can see that we can monitor this um, in the region of like sort of 325 to 370 nanometers, which is sufficient um, to monitor like, monitoring lysates of spectrophotometric screening. So. I should just say about this assay, it, doesn't, it clearly doesn't report on all features of Marita baylor silman chemistry, but what it does, it reports on the increasing nuclear felicity of the histidine nucleophile. It will report on hydrogen bonding contacts to this um, oxyanine species, um, and it will also report on sort of shape complementarity of the product to the active site of the enzyme. And so we believe that it'd be a valuable tool to start our engineering and really get this project off the ground. And so what we're looking at here now is probably approximately two and a half years of uh, laboratory evolution work. This is a really extensive evolution. So what we can see at the start in design is just in spheres, we're just showing the mutations predicted by design clustered onto the starting template. And you can see on the right hand side, what we're looking at is the reaction of the enzyme with the mechanistic inhibitor leading to some color formation. And again, you can see if you remove the histidine nucleophile, you abolish any function. So what we can see after approximately six rounds of directed evolution, accumulating 15 mutations into the protein is the dramatic increase in the rate of reaction towards this mechanistic inhibitor. So whereas the wild type protein takes approximately an hour to reach completion, what you can see with um, this backbone, or backbone 6 or BH32.6 is that the inhibition is complete in approximately a minute under identical reaction conditions. We were aware that this um, inhibition wasn't reporting on the overall catalytic turnover, which of course is the most important thing. So we, we then set up systems that we could monitor reactions, um, monitor the true steady state activity, uh, just by, monitor, by purely monitoring by HPLC and brute force screening. And we set up a sort of a dedicated laboratory to allow us to do ultra high, sort of kind of high throughput engineering using um, like in parallel HPLC analysis. So in total, through this laboratory evolution, we've accumulated a further 24 mutations on top of the starting design, and that correlates to approximately 10% of the protein that's been mutated during the evolution. Of course, the important thing is the effect on catalytic activity. So here we're looking at HPLC traces again. What you can see on the bottom here, this little blue blip, is the activity of BH32, which was the starting computation design. So we can probably see where this is going, um, that if you now install those 24 mutations for evolution, you can see a dramatic change in activity. And of course, these reactions are run under identical reaction conditions. So just to put some numbers to this, um, this is really just taking a snapshot along a reaction of, of the cat of sort of different catalysts at a defined reaction time. And what you can see is that you can achieve um, in four and a half hours 56% conversion with um, the BH32.10. In contrast, you get less than 0.5% conversion with the starting template or indeed if you knock out the histidine nucleophile. So you, if the, this is out of the best variant, I should say. And so what you can tell is that the, the chemistry is genuinely going down through an active site mechanism, which is important. And just to benchmark your catalyst against small molecules, um, this imidazole and dimethylaminopyridine are two of the most famous small molecule catalysts for Marita baylor silman reaction. And what you can see here is that even at very uh, prolonged reaction times and very high catalyst loadings, even, even super stoichiometric loadings, that you can see almost 0.5% conversion. So you can see that we've generated a really potent catalyst for this reaction. We can, of course, do some reaction optimization, et cetera. And we can, in preparative scale biotransformation, where we're making up to a gram of product here, what we can see is that you can drop the catalyst load into 0.5% and you can achieve very high conversion. So I'm, I'm confident this is a sort of a very usable Marita Baylor one catalyst. And as Nick mentioned earlier, like um, an anti-selectivity is one of the hallmarks of biotransformations. And like pleasingly in our case, what we observed is that despite the fact that we didn't apply any selection pressure, 
the enhanced selectivity of the catalyst correlates to improving efficiency. And so this actually is a highly, effect, highly efficient and selective Marita Bailey Coleman enzyme now. Um, we always sort of like really dig into details of the michaelis menten kinetics. I'm not going to talk in a great deal of detail today about this, but just to say that the, if you put some actual numbers to the catalyst efficiency, um, the best variant is all, over three orders of magnitude more efficient than BH32. And is again on top of that probably another two orders of magnitude better than small molecule catalysts. Okay, so this is actually quite a potent catalyst. So we are always very keen to sort of explore the structural origins of why these catalysts are improving so much during the course of evolution, because this is clearly going to inform the next rounds of computational design, the next generation of computational design. And so what I think um, is remarkable, what we're looking at here is an overlay of the design model compared to the most highly evolved catalyst. And despite the fact that we've mutated approximately 10% of the protein, what you can see is that the structures overlay in terms of the protein backbones remarkably well. But there are some substantial changes around the active site. So if you, if you look at the global active site volume, what you see is a substantial reduction in volume. And this clearly probably, uh, probably allows for like a more snug fit of the substrates in the active site and sort of maximizes production interaction. But if we just sort of zoom into the difference between in, in terms of the local active site of the design model compared to the most highly evolved variant, what immediately jumps out is that the original aldehyde binding pocket has now been occluded in the evolved variant. And the aldehyde actually adopts as sort of a new binding pocket has emerged where the aldehyde sits um, approximately orthogonal to the original design. In terms of the molecular recognition and molecular understanding, though, what's um, very interesting is that the histidine 23 nucleophile has been preserved and is still a key catalyst in residue. But in contrast, this glutamine 128 and the serine uh, 22, which were intended hydrogen bond donors to stabilize oxygen intermediates, have now been abandoned during evolution. And what's come in its place is this arginine 124 residue, uh, which I just highlighted at the bottom here. And you'll see on the next slide what the role of this residue is. And so, again, this is just, again, the chemical schematic. So you can see here the two intended hydrogen bond donors, and these were clearly separate in the original design model. And what's happened now, if you look at the DF, we've done a DFT analysis of this um, reaction progression. And what we see here is that in the first intermediate, when you, when you generate the bond between the substrate and the nucleophile, what you can see is that the arginine adopts a bridging hydrogen bonding mode to stabilize the first oxygen ion intermediate. This then is almost perfectly pre-organized for CC bond formation, which transfers the negative charge onto a second oxygen. And what's remarkable now in this case, and this is really unprecedented, I think, in protein catalysis, is that that arginine is perfectly positioned to just shuttle across to stabilize the second oxygen intermediate. Um, and they, effectively, the arginine just lies in between these two oxygen atoms and can, and can accommodate both conformations to allow this to happen. Um, if you look at the transition state, what you can see is that the arginine bridges both oxygen atoms. Again, likewise, you can go through the analysis, you can get, the, you get back to the third intermediate, which again is an oxygen ion back at the original carbon position. And again, the arginine can just sort of like subtly shuttle back into its original conformation. And just the numbers underpinning this, of course, we should, we obviously experimentally have to validate this DFT model. And if you remove this arginine residue, what you can see is an almost complete abolishment of catalyst. Okay, so in the first half, uh, what I've so, or so far what I've tried to show hopefully is that we can actually now begin to start building really complex catalytic mechanisms into proteins. But as an enzyme designer, uh, or as an organic chemist and an enzyme designer, there's, um, I would say, a, a kind of a significant fundamental limitation um, to the range of mechanisms that you can install into proteins. And that is effective that the genetic code is fixed. And you can only bring, um, the, sorry, the, the proteins are made of only 20 amino acids. And what this is, it really restricts the range of functional groups that you can embed into proteins. So you can imagine if you wanted to design completely new mechanisms, your hands are a little bit tied. And what my group really try and do is overcome that fundamental problem. And the way that we do this, I, if I had more time, I'd talk about this in greater detail. But effectively, what we can do is we can begin to install what I call here chemically programmed amino acids. Um, so effectively, amino acids with new functional side chains into proteins on a genetic level um, by re-engineering cellular translation systems. Okay, so this is research that was pioneered by Peter Schultz's laboratory. We just adapt this for catalytic applications. Um, this allows us to bring new functional groups into proteins on the genetic level. And the reason that's important, and hopefully I've already been shown today the power of directed evolution, is that that evolution process is underpinned by the fact that you encode your amino acids on the genetic level. Okay, and so in principle, we should now be able to create protein catalysts from a greater range of functional groups. 
And so we use this quite extensively to like as a tool to probe and sort of, I've said here, deconstruct biological mechanisms. And um, here's a project that was funded by the UK Catalysis Hub, which has delivered us some sort of mechanistic understanding of heme proteins. But what I really want to talk today is how we can start to integrate this into computational design um, and build mechanisms um, that are not accessible to nature effectively. And what I'm going to talk about, um, just, as a, oh, just a, a, as an example today, is our ability to perform nucleophilic catalysis within protein active sites. So I should start by saying that nucleophilic catalysis is a, is a very general strategy used in organic chemistry to catalyze a whole range of chemical transformations. Probably most um, well known is the hydrolytic transformations in acyl transfer chemistry. Okay, so I've just shown a general chemical scheme of this. And so there's been a great interest um, in attempting to design functional hydrolases from first principles. And I'm just going to show you some like reasonably big papers from quite prominent research groups where we've attempted, where those groups have attempted to install either catalyst histidine or cysteine or serine nucleophiles into proteins to accelerate, ester, to accelerate ester hydrolysis. And all of these catalysts, or so-called catalysts, have all suffered from the same fundamental problem. It's been possible to accurately embed a whole range of nucleophiles into proteins, so you can perform this first step quite effectively. But unfortunately, you, what, what is, this leads to is very stable acyl enzyme intermediates, and performing the hydrolytic turnover has proven incredibly challenging. And we felt that we could use an, an expanded genetic code to overcome this long-standing challenge in enzyme design. So as a starting point, what we initially found was that BH32, which was the original computational design, design for the Marita bayless hillman reaction, remember this uses a histidine nucleophile, we found at the outset of the project that this was a promiscuous esterase. And so if we um, incubate the enzyme with these uh, sort of aromatic esters, what we find, if you look at the reaction profile, is that you get this um, classic first phase kinetics. Okay, so I'll just explain that in more detail. What happens is the histidine 23 nucleophile um, reacts to form the acyl enzyme intermediate. This kicks out one equivalent of the leaving group fluorescein, which we're going to monitor spectrophotometrically. Um, and then what you end up with is a slow hydrolysis. Okay, so if you look at the reaction profile, what you find is that you get this formation of one equivalent of fluorescein compared to the enzyme concentration. Then the reaction effectively just stalls. And this is the classic formation of a stable, stable acyl enzyme intermediate, which you then just can't, you can't turn over. We can immediately see that the burst phase of this reaction, or so-called burst phase, is dependent upon the histidine nucleophile. So we know it's the histidine 23 that's doing the chemistry. The next thing to determine is which of the two, hist is, histidine is not symmetrical, so we have to then determine which of the two nitrogens is participating in chemistry. So if we inhibit the protein, here's a crystal structure of inhibited complex, we can see it's actually the n epsilon that's performing the chemistry. And so now we're in a place to try and rationally um, re-engineer this protein to actually perform uh, nucleophilic catalysis. And so what our hypothesis was is that the reason this doesn't work effectively is because we gen the histidine leads to the generation of a stable acyl enzyme intermediate uh, because it's, it, it forms a neutral complex. And the way that an organic chemist would overcome this is we would simply methylate the non-coordinating nitrogen. In principle, then, this would lead to a more reactive acyl and midazolium complex and lead to more facile turnover. And if you look at the reaction, pro what we, sorry, what I should say is we, we established engineered translation, translation components. We replaced the histidine nucleophile by now a genetically encoded methylated histidine. And now what you can see for the first time is a truly functional esterase inside a protein. Okay? Oh, in, sorry, a truly functional de novo esterase where we can actually achieve multiple catalytic turnovers. We subsequently, and this, this is still only a modestly active catalyst, okay, so well, obviously the power of protein catalysis is that we can subsequently engineer these proteins, proteins through laboratory creation. We had to adapt our workflows to an expanded genetic code. This has not been achieved previously. And so what you can see here is that sampling approximately 10,000 um, variants of this methylated histidine protein during laboratory evolution, you can see that you can start to get quite significant activity gains during, during the engineering. Here's just a mutational map showing where the mutations are clustered during evolution. And um, you can see again, Michaela's momentum parameters, you're getting substantial increases in the catalytic efficiency. Um, probably the most nerve wracking experiment along in, in any of this is you at the end of your engineering should really replace the non chronical nucleophile back with the original histidine. And pleasingly, when we did this, what we can see is that um, the function is abolished. Okay, so this activity is strictly dependent 
on the non-canonical nucleophile. And again, a very important parameter is that if we're designing protein catalysts or enzymes, we want them to accelerate reactions compared to the small molecule in solution. That's very important to us. And so even at a very early stage of evolutionary optimization, our catalyst still accelerates these reactions by about four orders of magnitude compared to the analogous small molecule in solution. So there's plenty of way to go to get to a natural enzyme efficiency here, but still four orders of magnitude, I think, is, is a reasonable efficiency gain. Okay, so just looking very briefly into the structural changes during evolution, again, what you can see is that the protein backbones overlay very well, but again, what you end up with is changes in the local active site environment. And in particular, what's emerged during evolution um, is, the, is two key residues, this, uh, this N46 and H19, in close proximity to the non chronic or catalytic nucleophile. And what this does, it, it generates an ordered, a new ordered water network, which we believe is important for both water delivery and also for performing pro key proton transfer steps along the reaction coordinate. One further mutation I want to highlight, which probably gave us the biggest gain in activity, was the last mutation we installed, um, was this rather remote proline installation, um, which happens at the interface of two domains in the protein. And we, we sort of puzzled about what this was doing for a while. Um, but what we believe is happening, so if you, what we did is we inhibited the protein to generate something which is reminiscent of the acylamidazole intermediate. And what we find here is that we, upon inhibition, our most highly evolved variant undergoes a very large conformational change between this cap and core domain, which leads to a large increase in solvent accessibility. If you remove that, that if you reinstall leucine in place of the proline, this conformational change is no longer observed by X-ray crystallography. So what we believe we've done here is imparted conformationally relevant dynamics in a de novo enzyme. And this really is a first, and we, we have to do a lot more work to follow up on this, but this is an avenue that I'm quite excited about because this is, the, the role of conformational dynamics in protein catalysis is, is sort of a long-standing uh, question. And so I'm quite excited about the fact we've done this in, the, in a de novo enzyme. Okay, so finally, some, some from the reviewers asked us to do, they asked us just to profile the substrate of the enzyme. And all, all I really want to just hone in on here is that in all cases, the, the, the more highly evolved variant is a far superior catalyst in, independent of the substrate. But what we did observe is that if we tried to introduce, sort of do an anti-selective transformation by introducing an alpha chiral center, as present in drug molecules such as ibuprofen and naproxen, um, what we found was that we got not only substantial reductions in activity, but we also got very low levels of enantia control. Okay, but of course, again, so this just showing you the adaptability of enzymes, we could subject our um, catalyst to a further round of laboratory evolution. What we see, now we're gonna screen, instead of, the, instead of just the CH2 substrate, we're gonna add this additional methyl component and supply a single enantiomer. And what we can find is that you see an additional three mutations clustered all around this proline 10 mutation, interestingly. So again, we believe dynamics is important there. And what we can see is we can start to actually evolve um, an anti-selective catalyst using this approach. So that's really all I want to talk about today. So um, hopefully I've shown that we can create enzymes for complex multi-step transformations that are not observed in nature. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that the Installing non chronical amino acids gives us new ways of imparting new or installing new functional groups into protein surveillance. Um, in particular, we've encoded a genetic surrogate, a genetically encoded surrogate of dimethylaminopyridine. And so we think we can access a, a whole range of transformations here. But it's also allowed us to resolve a long standing challenge in enzyme design, namely the design of hydrogen proteins. And I think this combination of genetic code expansion and laboratory evolution interplayed with computational en enzyme design is now giving us new approaches to be able to create new functional proteins, which are simply not, not accessible effectively to nature. So this is an area we're quite excited about. So probably the most important slide is the acknowledgements. Of course, I don't do any of this work and the work is carried out by a very productive and very, um, very highly skilled research team. And so I don't have time to name everyone, in, in, or everyone unfortunately, but I should say the work I've really spoken about today, uh, Rebecca Crawshaw, um, and Amy Crossley on the Marita Bayless Hillman work, um, Ashley Burke and Sarah Lovelock, who did our um, hydrolase engineering work. But again, all of the team contribute a huge amount to the group, and so I'm very grateful to them. I've got some great uh, local collaborators as well as collaborators from um, internationally. Um, gen certainly great to us all, grateful to all the funding bodies, the ERC and BBSRC in particular. Also, a great shout, great thanks to the UK Catalysis Club, who have been hugely supportive of my career. Um, and yeah, thank everyone for their attention and we'll be happy to take any questions.
Um, so unfortunately on the webinar we can't uh, let you uh, ask your questions but if you could type them into the q and A, I'll read them out and Nick and Anthony can answer them. Are there any questions? Oh, quiet on the question front at the moment. I don't know if that's just because you explained everything so well or if everyone's being shy. While we're waiting for a question, I'd just like to say thank you for an excellent, I don't know if it's one talk or two, but a very excellent talk. I certainly know more about biocatalysis as a, as, as a traditional, well, I don't think I'm even a chemist. I started as an engineer and transferred to chemistry, um, but I certainly know more than I did. Um, so I've got a question for Anthony. For the MBH evolved enzyme, in addition to the ARG rotomeric change, is there a backbone conformational change? Um, so there are, there are no large scale backbone conformational changes. There are minor adjustments, but what I would say um, is that there is a very large change in the Wilson B factor. So the, the protein has become substantially more disordered. Oh, is, is it from Roberto? Hi, Roberto. Roberto. Uh, the, the, pro, the protein has become substantially more disordered uh, during evolution. Um, and so the Wilson B has gone up to, to a, a level that so I'm not a crystallographer, um, so probably you know better than I do, Roberto, but um, our crystallographer was saying it was, it was kind of at the limit of what he's seen, basically, for, um, in crystal structures that he's solved. I hope that answers your question, Roberto. Uh, thank you. Roberto says thank you. And CMJ says thank you very much for a, a good talk. Uh, John Finley has a question. Do you see many industrial applications for biocatalysis? Can you mention the most likely? I think that's to either of you. Do you want to go next? This is probably for you. Well, yeah, there are many, many existing applications of biocatalysis in industry. I mean, I think what's changed in the last 20 years is the pharmaceutical industry has always embraced biocatalysis um, because it works on a very broad range of molecules, many of which are very high value. And, and even when biocatalysis was perceived as being perhaps um, difficult to do and a little expensive, the pharmaceutical industry supported it and adopted it and now has many examples of molecules that are made on a manufacturing scale using engineered biocatalysts. Some of the world's most famous medicines such as Lipitor uh, wouldn't be produced at such a low cost were it not for the availability of engineered biocatalytic processes. Um, but I think what you are seeing now is that, um, that it's not just the pharmaceutical industry that use engineered biocatalysts. The technology is becoming easier, cheaper, more rapidly implemented by chemists in industry. So it's moved from pharmaceuticals to agrochemicals to pretty much any part of the chemical industry where a catalyst is needed in a process. So that can include flavors, fragrances, fine chemicals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is a trend that is not going to reverse because this whole approach is going to become easier and quicker and faster and cheaper. Anthony, you were going to say something. I was just, I was just going to chip in with antibiotics, obviously the penicillins, etc. made on a huge, huge scale. So. I hope that answers your question, John. Um, Alberto would like to know, oh, it says thank you for a great presentation. Have you tried to hydrolyze ureas or carbamates with your esterase? No, thanks for the suggestion. We haven't tried um, the um, ureas and carbonates yet. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's something we should probably try actually. Um, so yeah, it's kind of something on our radar and we, yeah, we, def we definitely should have done that. So we, we should, uh, yeah, that's something we'll get to. Um, we have an anonymous question that says, how do you think biocatalysis will develop in the future? Well, okay, I'll go first again, and then it, it, it will become more along the lines, I think, of what you've heard today. There will be more design, 
more discovery based on sequences that have been lying in nature for millions and millions of years. So, you know, it's always interesting to ask what is the rate determining step in this whole process? And to be honest, and I don't mean this from a kinetics, I mean this more from a philosophical point of view, the rate determining step is our ability, I think, probably to be able to screen all of the possible sequences that we can possibly generate. And I think that applies to any of the approaches that you've heard about today. That is still a relatively slow step, given the fact that you can generate, you know, unbelievable number of sequences by just making even point mutations in a protein. You cannot screen billions and billions of new catalysts routinely. And so uh, if we could, we could, the whole process of discovery would, would accelerate by another order of magnitude at least. Yeah, I mean, obviously from my own perspective, I would, I would personally like to see us get to the stage where we could, um, you know, these effectively design protein sequences that can catalyze, you know, that can, you can effectively design proteins that for practical applications straight from the computer. Um, we're a long, we're a long, long way away from that. Um, but that, that would kind of be a game changing technology for, because then, then you wouldn't have to do the extensive and exhaustive um, laboratory evolution experiments that we've sort of mentioned today, they're incredibly powerful, but they're also very time consuming and typically like used by specialist labs, I think. And so I think if we, if we could get to the stage where we could design efficient catalysts from scratch, I think that'd be very exciting. Okay. Uh, one for Nick here. How, um, which technique do you use for creating genetic diversity for directed evolution? We, we use... Oh, we, we use what people would regard as very classical approaches. They weren't classical 20 years ago, but I mean, error-prone PCR is still a fantastic way of making libraries and it's quite easy to do. Um, there, are, there are many, many ways of making new sequences, um, gene shuffling, uh, variants of error-prone PCR, but, um, you know, that, that, that is not where the new, in, mentions have occurred I would say in the last five to ten years because making libraries is relatively straightforward um, and so we just use our prone PCR because it works and you can train brand new PhD students to do it in a few weeks. Yeah you, you can also do more, more targeted mutagenesis techniques are often used so if you, especially if you've got crystal structures you would uh, potentially target you, you, really the library generation is um, I would say that you know, not the step which worries us too much. Um, and so we can, we can create genetic diversity more quickly than we can screen genetic diversity typically. That answers the question. Um, there's a question for Anthony. How convenient is it to express protein or enzymes with unusual amino acids? Oh. Uh, from yeah, sorry, I, I can read here, sorry. Um, le less convenient than without, uh, I would say, um, but certainly it's become usable. And the, the trick is, um, is that one, once you have your translation components established for an amino acid of interest, then it's very powerful because you can, you can then install that amino acid into any protein at any position. The, the key, you, but in itself, to, if you've got an amino acid of, of interest, so I should say that you can encode pro approximately 300 amino acids now effectively into proteins with a whole range of different structures. If you want a new one in, that becomes a project in its own right. You really have to then go and do an extensive laboratory evolution project to engineer the cellular translation. So you typically take some reduction in protein yields, and again, it's all on the efficiency of that system, basically. How good is your nutrient relation system? A question from Alex. Um, I'm not sure who it's to. What is the scope of introducing non-canonical amino acids? Is it unlimited or are there restrictions, i.e. uptake challenging for some over others? Okay, so um, it's, it's not unlimited, but it's getting a larger and larger set of being, um, of being engineered. So again, I, I would estimate about approximately 300 we can encode now. Um, Often the limitation is the fact, obviously, you've got to engineer your cellular translation system to tolerate your amino acid. Um, however, as you highlight, uptake can be challenging in cases where, I mean, it's, it's difficult to predict, but often in cases where you've got heavily charged amino acids. 
So in those cases, what you can do though is you can protect you can protect them and unmask them in vivo, um, or you can even biosynthesize them. So lots to, lots on the table, but definitely like some present more technical challenges than others. So Matthew Pye from Liverpool Caricom um, says thanks for a great talk. Um, a broad question from an organic chemist point of view: How easy are biocatalyst biocatalyzed reactions to set up? Can they be done simply using standard equipment, i.e. round bottom flasks, or are there specific pieces of must-have equipment needed to carry out these reactions? You know what I tell my students? If you can do organic chemistry, biocatalysis is a walk in the park because you, you do, you're working in water, typically, maybe some co-solvent. You don't need any specialist equipment generally for excluding oxygen, except in a few special cases. Um, you, these things are done in batch reactors in industry. Um, it's, it's, it may seem complicated, and I hope it doesn't come across that way from our presentations today, but one of the real, the, you know, seriously, the real attraction of biocatalysis, certainly in terms of application, is that when you've, once you've engineered your biocatalyst to work on your molecule, the, the scale-up is relatively straightforward because you're, you're able to use solvents like water or solvents that are not you know banned for various regulations you're not dealing with pyrophoric materials you're not dealing with explosive materials enzymes typically don't explode or catch fire to my best of my knowledge so the chemistry is taking place under very mild conditions at room temperature at atmospheric pressure these are all the things that are on the wish list of organic chemists and chemical engineers. Thank you. Um, so Andy Moore asks, uh, when commercialising redox enzymes, is it common for industry to recycle cofactors in situ? Yeah, and that's a solved problem. It wasn't a solved problem 20 years ago. Um, cofactor recycling uh, certainly NADH and NADPH is widely practiced. The enzymes that you need to, co to recycle cofactors have themselves been heavily engineered by companies like Codexis, but other companies. And so the, the number of turnovers that you can achieve with those cofactor recycling systems is truly extraordinary and means that the cost contribution of the cofactor to the overall process becomes essentially negligible or at least it's not the it's not a significant cost contributing factor there will be other more expensive components of the uh, reaction thank you um, so roberto is asking hi nick you mentioned there are no known r specific ammonia liases sorry if i've mispronounced that which is a surprising given the planet planarity of the substrate reactive group. Do you think there's a chemical reason for this or is it simply that nature has no need to make R amines using these enzymes? Well, I guess so. you, you should be a little cautious. There are, yeah, Roberta's right. There are no known, underlying known. Uh, that means we haven't found them yet, perhaps. Um, and it is remarkable given the fact that when you find enzymes now, you sort of assume that there will be both R and S selected versions of those enzymes uh, known in nature, if you look hard enough. And Roberto is right, uh, the, the, the enzymes that create the enantiomer of the natural amino acids using the ammonia lyase mechanism have so far not been either found nor created in the laboratory. We tried, in fact, Sarah Lovelock tried hard in our group uh, so that's one for you, Anthony. You can solve that one. You can be the first person to create an R-selective ammonia lyase. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's a simple problem, actually, because all you need to do is protonate that double bond from the other face. And it's an anti-addition of ammonia to a double bond. And so it seems like, a, on the face of it, a trivial problem to reverse the position in space of the amine, the ammonia, and the proton but nature hasn't tried, chosen to do it. I, I've known many people trying that, try that engineering feat, Nick. So 
<laughs> and people have engineered inverted active sites. I mean, that principle is well established in the literature that you yeah. can take a keto reductase or a hydrolytic enzyme, as Anthony described, and you can essentially invert in three dimensional space the residues across the other side of the active site, but it hasn't occurred for many liases. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious that we're running past four o'clock, but if the speakers are okay to continue, I'll try and answer the last few questions that we've got in. Um, question, mm -hmm. Anthony, I find really fascinating your work on UAA. Given progress in the peptide protein synthesis, how quickly do you think the two approaches can be productively merged? Um, I, I, first of all, yeah, no, no doubt the, the, the pep, peptide and protein, the, the advancements in peptide and protein synthesis is, is, is amazing. Um, and, you know, however, having said that, you can't compare the efficiency compared to cellular translation. So as a, just as a flavor in my talk, I probably presented upwards of 30,000 protein sequences that we've analyzed um, during, one, during one or two evolution projects. I wouldn't necessarily want to go and do a total synthesis of um, that number of proteins. And um, having said that, the, um, what's it called? There are some situations where we just can't get amino acid free cellular translation. So if we have specific questions to address that requires a particular chemical building block, then absolutely like the, the, the peptide and protein synthesis, the total synthesis approach is very, very powerful for addressing some questions that we currently can't address with GC, with genetic code expansion. But given a choice, I'll go, I would go for the genetic code expansion route um, personally. Okay, thank you. Um, my screen's just scrolled. Um, what's the main advantage of biocatalysis and asymmetric synthesis if it's similar activity, E value can be achieved by molecular catalysis with a little higher temperature? Um, so, go on, sorry. So, I mean, there are, there are numerous advantages, I would say. Um, Nick will probably give one or two after me. I mean, one of them is, the, I would say for me, the main one is the efficiency that you can achieve with an enzyme far surpasses almost any small molecule catalyst. If, if you take out rare earth metals, when you start to introduce rare earth metals into systems like palladium and things, then you can get some different types of catalysis. But if, you, if you're comparing a protein catalyst to a small organocatalyst, the efficiencies with the protein uh, is typically many orders of magnitude faster, uh, higher. Um, do, you, do you want to go, Nick? Yeah, if you if you look at chiral alcohols, chiral amines, just as an example, um, many of those biocatalytic processes go head to head with transition metal catalyzed processes. They are not sustainable. The cost of transition metals for uh, use in catalysis for pharmaceuticals is not sustainable. Biocatalysis is an inherently sustainable technology. There are other issues associated with using metal catalysts, which is why people try to switch, and that is contamination of final products with, with even parts per billion of transition metal catalysts. So enzymes increasingly are used in, in final stage of API manufacture because they give cleaner products. Thank you. Uh, Dominic asks uh, or says, Anthony, great MBH new biocatalysis. You started with the BH core slash template, but could try using another template to get MBH, i.e. are there many ways to skin a cat? Uh, hi, hi, Dominic, by the way, uh, we've, not, we've not spoke for a while. Yeah, so of, of course, yeah, we, we, I mean, you know, fundamentally, I'm interested in creating proteins from, from first principles. So fundamentally, it's um, just for my interest area, it pays to go from a, yeah, we want to do computational design because that's what our ambitions are. Um, there is obviously, I mean, me and you, I think, have spoken several times about this particular point that there are some reports in the literature of like some very, very low level of um, activity with natural proteins. But as we've talked about, that the, the biochemistry around those is not is in case, some cases not particularly strong. Um, and for example, if you his tag the protein, that probably you know that's a cause of one of the things. And obviously, you I know me and you have spoken about that in the past. So th th I think there's still a jury is still out on whether or not it's genuine active site chemistry, um, like it is in the design. But I think the main driver from what we're saying is I I just want to be able to design things from scratch. That's, what, that's why we went for the design. Um.
Tom asks, do commercially available enzymes vary in price, like how different transition metal catalysts do? And if so, why? Uh, Presumix are a very good company. Uh, I mean, I know we work with them, so probably I ought to issue a disclaimer. But they, they have a very good model where you can get enzymes for free for screening purposes, and you only need to pay when you require larger quantities. Uh, to me, that's a very good model for encouraging wider use of, of biocatalysts. Some companies will sell you those initial screening plates, but some will make them available because they want you to find hits and they want you to come back and then um, perhaps order larger quantities. So, um, I say specific on, on the transition metal, I think we, with biocatalysis, we don't have the same problem with security of supply. If, if you're talking about the rare earth metals, which um, is very, the, the price is very dependent on, on geopolitical pressures, etc. cetera, um, we don't have the same security of supply problem. So you can probably as a company be more secure in your supply chains. Um, that's, my, my, that's my understanding, my feeling about that. Thank you. And the last question, following on from Matt's question, um, what limitations do you see on substrate products from a water solubility perspective? So, so if you're working in purely aqueous conditions, of course, if you've got a hydrophobic substrate, you will hit a, a barrier of solubility. But however, many enzymes work perfectly fine in organic solvents, and you can certainly engineer them to work in organic solvents if you so choose. So, I mean, for example, the Bayless Hillman that I, I said, uh, enzyme that we evolved, even though we put no selection pressure on it, that will tolerate temperatures up to 78 degrees. It will tolerate 30% DMSO concentrations. So, you know, it's so obviously clearly something to be concerned about, but no, but you, it's a solvable problem. Um, you, you define your reaction conditions and engineer your enzyme towards it. And all I would add is, if you go back to directed evolution, um, what, what people increasingly do is uh, focus during the early stages of evolution on maybe thermostability or organic solvent tolerance. Uh, those two often go hand in hand. There are also targeted mutagenesis methods available to improve thermostability. We use them and uh, there are many methods available now uh, to do that. So you can, you can generate a population of variants that's more organic solvent tolerant, more thermostable, and use those to create enzymes with the specificity that you need for target molecule application. Thank you. One last question snuck in. Do you see any potential applications in environmental catalysis, clean air and water? Yeah, if, um, a lot of the companies that get started in the area of biocatalysis, particularly if they have a mobilization technology, one of the big applications is wastewater treatment, just to pick one in terms of environmental. It's not all about making sexy chiral pharmaceutical building blocks. There are a lot of uh, applications out there in terms of environmental cleanup and, and water treatment where you need robust, active, highly active, reusable, um, engineered biocatalysts. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had lots of thanks on the chat for, uh, for a great talk and Green's put up the link for the next talk if anyone's interested, which is by Simon Freakley from Bath. Um, I'd like to thank Nick and Anthony again. That was a really excellent talk and thanks for hanging around a bit to answer the questions. Um, we will hopefully put the recording up in a few weeks. Um, I think that's everything. Okay. Thank you, yep. Rosie. Thanks That's very much. Speakers. Thanks again, and I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.